We live in a world that imagines truth to be some sort of subjective experience where your truth is different from my truth, which is different from his truth, and it's different for everybody else, right? Well, what if this is a bunch of crap? What if there is such a thing as truth? I'm talking about truth with a capital T, the truth that comes to us naturally. You see, truth is true, period, always. In time, out of time, on the side of time, truth is responsible for time. So if something changes in time, it is simply following the law of truth. Just as an apple can fall and we can measure its changing position in time because of the law of gravity, which is outside of time and fixed, so too do the things in our life unfold and act dynamically according to the fixed law of truth. Truth is true, and it is true for everyone. At every point in time, it doesn't change. If it changes, it's because that's the nature of truth, to change. It doesn't matter who is observing the truth. Truth is true for you and for me, always. So if your truth is different from my truth, then that is not the truth that combines you and me. Truth is responsible for you and for me. This is the truth that sets you free. <laughs> this, yes, is truth with a capital T. So when we start from this place, when we come from a place of mutual unified truth with a capital T, we are coming from a profound place of agreement. Truth with a capital T, the truth that comes to us naturally. This is the truth that sets you free and lets you see and unites you and me, truth with a capital T. This is the truth to the max degree. The truth will set you free and let you see and unite you and me. When we start from this place of truth with a capital T, which unites you and me, then we come from a place of profound agreement. No longer are we looking upon the world and interacting with the world from a place of, well, this guy's truth is different from my truth and the best we can each do is just be happy some of the time. No, we're talking about truth with a capital T, the truth that comes naturally. It unites you and me and it sets you free. So this is the truth that is, period. We don't need to make it true. We don't need to even know it is true. It's just true. And when we start from this place, then we're coming from a place of truth and we come to see the truth in every one of our encounters. We see the truth in our encounter with somebody, this profound agreement that we are here together out of all the places that we can be, we are here together. And we could just not be, but we are, we are, and we're here together. This is profound agreement. This is profound agreement and truth with a capital T, the truth that comes to us naturally. This is the truth that sets you free and lets you see and unites you and me, truth with a capital T. This is the truth to the max degree. The truth will set you free and let you see and unite you and me. So that sounds all fine and dandy, but what about the world as it actually is? What about all the problems that are out in the world? Well, let's take a look at, an honest, let's take an honest inspection of the world as it is right now. We collectively produce enough food to feed everyone in the world. And yet, the restaurant produces so much food that it throws its leftovers into the trash can while the family down the street is out hungry for the night. And the family across the world is starving to death. We have the resources to build structure, shelter, and provide clean water for everybody on this planet. And yet, how many people in this nation alone are out sleeping on the sidewalk? How many of these people are children? Homeless children. We have a climate that is changing so rapidly that infrastructure is crumbling, falling, faster than we can build it. People are evacuating countries because they're no longer habitable. Sea levels are rising, making cities uninhabitable. And yet, we continue to debate 
what this thing is called in the first place, or what our exact involvement in it is. And we can go on and on, days and days about this, but I know that you know that we are fully capable of resolving all of these issues. This is why we're here, to be the solution to these great problems. Not just to continue talking about them and debating over them, but to actually resolve them. The only trick, the only thing we have to stay focused upon is the actual solution. Not the form of the solution, but the solution, the resolution, and not to get distracted by the conflict. The conflict is designed for us to get distracted and talk about the surface layer of the issue. But we don't need to do that. We can let that go and we can focus in the resolution. And what would happen if we focused on the resolution? What would happen? What would we do? What would, well, have you ever really thought about this? Will we collectively, humanity as a whole, focused on the resolution? Maybe it would come. <laughs> and we're not talking about just a resolution for a trivial problem. We're talking about resolution of problem. You, universal flourishing, it's a cellular nourishing where the whole is encouraged. It will embrace to grace you. It will embrace to grace you. Universal flourishing, it's a cellular nourishing where the whole is encouraged. It will embrace to make one individual collectivization. Universal flourishing. Have you ever considered this? Maybe, but we collectively, the, great, the closest we've come to approaching this in a public conversation is maybe universal basic income, which, what would that give us? More money and more problems? <laughs> what about universal healthcare? Ah yes, we can all have coverage while we're all still sick. No, we want universal flourishing. We want to flourish. We don't just want healthcare. We want to flourish. We don't just want income. We want to flourish. So let's start from this point and hold this true within yourself because this is you. Universal flourishing. It's a cellular nourishing where the whole is encouraged. It will embrace to grace you. It will embrace to grace you. Universal flourishing. It's a cellular nourishing where the whole is encouraged. It will embrace to make one individual collectivization. The universe begins with you, so it is your choice. What would you like to focus upon? Would you like to continue to build your individual life while the world is crumbling? Or would you like to be part of the global movement to collectively flourish? Which, by the way, includes you. You are a part of the collective in flourishing. So when you contribute to collective flourishing, you're not missing out on anything. You're only sharing your flourishing with all the rest of the world, while you yourself flourish in unimaginable, unexpected ways. Meaning that this is in your power. The power is within you to bring about this global change. You've probably been conditioned into thinking that, well, you have some control over your thoughts and control over your words and your actions and, and some control over your life, but not the world. That's beyond your power, right? Well, maybe, maybe. What if that were a misguided idea about the nature of who we are? See, we've been conditioned into thinking that our ideas of perfection, that my idea of perfection is fundamentally different from your idea of perfection, and so we're in conflict with one another in order to get our individual ideas of perfection manifest in the world. But that's a bunch of bunk. That's a bunch of crap. Our idea of perfection is shared. We received it from the same source. Any differences we may have are in the form of it which ultimately, at the end of the day, don't really mean too much. The content of our perfect idea of life is exactly the same. The truth is that I cannot flourish unless you are flourishing. You cannot flourish unless you all of your friends are flourishing. How could you really be flourishing in your silo with all the resources and whatever it is that you want while one of your friends is struggling or down in the dumps. Not possible. And your friend can't be flourishing unless all of your friend's friends are struggling. Until we cover the entire globe. We are all in this together. We're part of an inescapable web of mutuality. We're all in this together. And so we're all flourishing 
or we're all not. The power is within you because you get to decide the world that you experience. You get to decide how you choose to see the world and what your focus upon the world is. How are you looking going about in the world? Are you looking to pad your personal ego or are you looking to bolster and strengthen and expand universal flourishing? We've been taught into thinking that it's an either or proposition that we can either benefit ourselves or we could benefit the rest of the world. But that's a bunch of bunk. We can do both at the same time. And so why would we settle for just ourself alone? We could be benefiting ourself and all of the world. This is a true solution and a true solution exists. Not only does it exist, it is what is most natural when we allow it to be. This is the solution that is available to you right here now, eternally in this moment, to choose flourishing, not just for your isolated self, but for all of the world with you. It starts with you because we can't flourish unless you're starting us to. But don't you think that the power is up to you alone? You cannot be alone and thank God that this is the case. You have all of humanity with you, supporting and holding this collective desire for universal flourishing. Universal flourishing begins with you, but there are many characters that follow the you, and they're with you <laughs> in this endeavor, in this intention, in this collaboration. We are here to collectively flourish. There's no sh shorter, there's no sense in selling ourselves short of universal flourishing because whatever we put our desire upon, whatever we put our intention upon, we will achieve. So let us achieve universal flourishing. You have many actors, many people to help you along the way. All of humanity which have come before us have given us their written records, their opinions, their struggles, what has worked, what has not worked, and they're supporting on, going, going like this, clapping. And we have many people here which are now sharing this collective intention. For the first time ever, universal flourishing is becoming a collective intention. People are starting to tune in to the possibility that this thing can actually happen that we can be a part of it. We can experience it. And so you have help. From all of humanity, you have help. Of course, you have, te you have help from many teachers. You have help from teachers that can tell you exactly what you need to hear today. You have help from teachers that can keep you on the right track, on the rails of this intention, keep you focused when you're tempted to fall off the tracks. You have teachers like And beyond our human teachers, our people, the people who call themselves teachers, you have everybody in your life that you, that you encounter. You see, when you shift your desire from an individual ego-oriented goal to a collective universal goal, you now are invoking the universal collective to help you out. Before, it was just you and your ego, and things were pretty difficult, right? Things were pretty challenging and the victories were short-lived and they were experienced only by you. But this is involving everybody in the planet. This is our collective goal. So you have the collective to help you along the way. Every encounter that you have when holding this is contributing to this goal. Whether you see it immediately or not, whether the person knows it or not. When you encounter somebody and they give you a tough time, saying that the idea is crap, saying that it's not possible, whatever it may be, this is actually contributing to
to you in your manifesting of this goal. You have a chance to now explain how this goal is possible to somebody who no longer, who doesn't think it's possible. And regardless whether they see it in your encounter or not, you have shared it and you've planted that seed and now you have grown stronger in your ability to plant the seed. So every encounter that you have only strengthens your desire and your manifestation of our collective desire. So you have help and the help is not short. The help is long and omnipresent and it's just for you. Oftentimes oneness is framed as some sort of sacrifice that in order for me to embrace our one self, I need to first give up myself. This is exactly wrong. You don't have a self until you've embraced our one collective self. How is this possible? Well, check it. This is how life is brewed. Sit quick and listen, dude. Joy, joy, it is untold when one is the number that's bold. You can become attuned to a spicy lightning groove. Joy is all you know when one is the number you sow. And so we sow. Isn't it a riddle though? It seems low, but kiss it like a mistletoe. One is a profound revelation, a foundation, the means of creation. It's not an overstatement to make to say that we, together, create fate. Lately, it seems that unfortunately, we find it cool to be separating. But that's just a plaything. Let's return to the source of all things amazing. I'm talking about what you came here to face. The grace of our creator is within your space. And they may say that you're just at peace, but really, they're close. You're just peace. Be who you are. Doing is not applicable. You can't undo you like laces on a shoe. Truth is true and truth is you. Listen to this list imbued with vision clues with which witnesses to choose to view you for everywhere you look. You see you. And you can discount it now, but you will come back around because even if lost, your destiny is found. This is how life is brewed. Sit quick and listen. Dude, the joy, joy it is untold when one is the number that's bold. You can become attuned to a spicy life and groove. Joy is all you know when one is the number you sow. So, how do we do it? What do we say? What do we think? First of all, who is it that's thinking? Do you really think you are your thoughts? Or are your thoughts being given to you? You can think whatever you want, but inspiration comes of its own accord, and inspiration is our invocation, and it's okay to delay. But why wait to embrace the inevitable inheritance of our race? Don't you remember you've always been? If not, you'll soon begin, because this eternal thing that we call life is the one thing that has but one side. One mind is where thought resides. One kind is our human tribe. If you assume you'll die, you're not alive. The solution is simple, immediate, and free. It's between the between, it's between you and me. It's a belief that believing proceeds into being, and seeing is an internal reflection of meaning. There's a reason for your breathing. And it's not just to kick dust up. You're the only one of us, because we are one, bruh. <laughs> this is how life is brewed. Sit quick and listen. Dude, the joy, joy it is untold when one is the number that's bold. You can become attuned to a spicy life and groove. Joy is all you know when one is the number you sow. This is how life is brewed. Sit quick and listen. Dude, joy, joy it is untold when one is the number that's bold. You can become attuned to a spicy life and groove. Joy is all we know when one is the number we sow. And to be fully transparent, 
there is a sacrifice that is asked for us when we transform, when we transition from an individuated, separated, limited self into a collective, one unlimited self. But the sacrifice is often misinterpreted. It's often misunderstood. The sacrifice is of sacrifice itself. We are sacrificing a limited idea of ourself. That's what we're called to give up. We are called to surrender these ideas about ourself. But what are these ideas about ourself? Any belief we have of a separated self that is separated from the world and from everyone else is ultimately an illusory self. It's an imagined self. We will all come to know this for a fact. And we can all know this right now. We can start to feel into this and accept this for ourselves right now. And in order to do this, we are called to relinquish these ideas we have about ourselves that we may hold so dearly. Our beliefs, our thoughts about ourselves and the world, they are our thought children. Just as a mother feels for her child that sort of instinctual protection and attachment, this is the attachment we feel for our own thoughts and our own beliefs, how we think about ourselves and this world. But what if it's all wrong? What if we're completely misguided in our understanding of ourselves? What if we're selling ourselves short? These are the questions that we can begin to ask ourselves because the sacrifice we are making of this limited self is truly the sacrifice of nothing. It's sacrificing nothingness. It's an idea that doesn't exist. So it's not actually something to give up. It's giving up the notion of giving up. It's the final sacrifice. But it still seems like a sacrifice when we're bought into these ideas about ourself and this world. But we can do this because we know that this world is far greater than we've ever considered before. And right now, we're starting to feel into this and know it experientially. And so as you sacrifice this idea of sacrifice, as you relinquish the limiting ideas you have about yourself, and embrace the one self, which is our collective birthright, what may happen is that the structures that you had built around you begin to crumble. All of these illusory structures start to fall down because that is their natural state. When we have ideas of ourself that are not true, limiting ideas, uh, temporal ideas, ideas of finiteness or, or exclusion from the whole. When we hold these about ourselves, we are building a tower upon a foundation of sand using scotch tape and bubble gum. And we're, we're putting wood together and plastic and trying to mash it together. And once we have some semblance of a structure around ourself, it requires our utmost attention, effort, and strength to just keep it in place. This is what we're doing when we're believing in a limited self, in a small self, in a separated self. We have a shabby structure that is unsheltering for us. It's built upon sand and all our effort goes to just keeping it in place. And this thing is falling, so we go and we're juggling just to keep this structure into place. And so when we relinquish the small self and we embrace the one self, what we're doing is we're letting off. We're just letting go of this structure that has entrapped us, that we thought had protected us. We thought very rightfully so that this thing was our protection. And now we're getting a sense that maybe this is not why I'm here. Maybe this is not my protection. And so we let off for a moment. And in so doing, 
the shelter begins to crumble because it was always crumbling. And because we're not holding it up, it's actually falling down. And this can be a very trying time. <laughs> it can be to live in life and take on faith that yourself, that our self, this one collective self is far greater than we ever imagined. And it is accessible to us right here and now. And it's in fact calling for you to be accepted right now. And yet when feeling into this and living this, everything around us seems to be crumbling down. But do not worry. This is not an eternal state. This is a temporary happening, just as it was a temporary happening to build that structure around you in the first place because you were just doing the best you could and we were just doing the best we could, making do in this world to try and protect ourselves. And now these things are falling down around us, temporarily. But just notice, as they're falling around you, and of course this is happening collectively to us too, this is not just for you. This is for all of us collectively. And we're all experiencing this collectively too. As these systems and our thought systems and our, some relationships and projects and positions begin to crumble around us, and things that we once valued, we now see as valueless, and, and things just seem to be falling apart, and yet, we feel a profound peace in the midst of this. What is this all about? The whole life is crumbling apart and yet, uh, at least according to the world, and yet this is peace right here. I feel this for the first time because in this shelter, this shabby unsheltering shelter of separated self, we had built around us and, and we'd installed windows. We were clever, opaque plastic windows that every once in a while, just a glimmer of sunlight would shine in onto us from this shelter. And, and this was just, this was the delight of our being that we would just get just a piece of sunlight on, on one part of our face. And this, this was happiness for us. But now when the shelter is crumbled, we're in the sun. <laughs> You're basking in the sunlight, brother. You're reveling in your glory, sister. All of this, now, now this is natural. And the sun is, is holding on us now. And, and this just feels right. And I'm no longer efforting all the time. And this is beautiful. And I'm safe and I'm protected. And this is far more glorious than I ever thought life could be in that box. So just remember that when things are falling apart all around you, and you've embraced your one self, that that's a temporary happening. The peace that you feel is eternal and timeless. And so as the structure around you crumbles and you walk into this new world, even though you have an ID card in your pocket with a name and birth date, and you have a set of photographs showing all of the things you've done and you have a history that people can relate to you. You feel new. You feel like, yes, I remember all of these things. Yes, I do remember being a part. And, and yet, I'm someone new now. There's a newness that has emerged. Sort of like a rebirth. And in fact, this is a rebirth. This is a spiritual rebirth. And when there is any birth, when anybody is born, when any creature is born in this world, there are, we are presented with new and perhaps unexpected rhythms of life. In this spiritual rebirth, we are like an infant in the world. And we were all comfortable in the womb for so long, for our entire uh, memory of existence, we were comfortable and warm and we didn't have to do a thing. And now we're out in the world and we can see. And it's difficult because now there are new rhythms to this life of which I'm not yet accustomed. There are new rhythms in this life that you may not be familiar with, you may not have been expecting. As we embrace this one collective self, and as 
some of the systems and structures and thought uh, paradigms that we have held begin to fade as the newness of oneness presents itself, we may be presented with unexpected rhythms of this newness. It may be something that wasn't expected. Things may be coming in your life that were not anticipated. You may not have been considering any changes in your life at all, and yet everything has changed. Even if nothing has changed circumstantially, everything in internally has changed with you. And so being out in this world, what had once seemed important may no longer be important. And what was never even considered may now be the one value. And all of this may bring unexpected sways and ebbs and flows and circuitry in this life. And it may not have been anticipated it may not have been forecasted, and yet it's here. And we will all come to know how to navigate in these new rhythms because these rhythms are eternal rhythms. These rhythms are not just another illusory made up part of life. These are the rhythms of life itself. And so as we grow accustomed to these new rhythms of life, we're coming to find a sweetness in the air, a sweetness about ourself and the world around us, a sweet innocence. We are coming to embrace this innocence and you can embrace this innocence. Now, the world, the world of separation, that thought paradigm, the belief that we are inherently separate, that has conditioned us into believing that innocence is childish. At a certain point, we lose our innocence and we become adults. And even innocence is, is not even desired at a certain point. But what we are now coming in to embrace is the understanding that innocence is strength. Innocence is being aware of who we are and letting it shine forth for all of humanity and all of this world. There is nothing you have to hide. In truth, there is nothing you can hide. All of your thoughts are visible to God, not in some creepy big brother sense, but in the loving God sense that God knows who you are. God knows how you feel and what you're thinking. And so you don't need to hide this. We've been so conditioned into thinking that we have to hide who we are in order to protect ourselves. But the truth is that if we hide who we are, we never find who we are. In order for you to be fully you, you have to be willing to be fully you. You are called to put yourself on public display. Your innocence is your strength. And as we all collectively step into this, into the fullness of this, we step into the innocence of perfection, that we are who we are, we're not hiding anything, and this experience is rich because you are perfect as are we all, as is this world. And when you embody and exude this innocence, you are encouraging and fostering within everyone else in your path to do exactly the same. Mahatma Gandhi invites us to be the change we wish to see in the world. This is not just for your sake alone. This is for all of our sakes. This is for Christ's sake. When you embody the change that you wish to see in the world, you are performing a grand experiment. You're demonstrating publicly what it means to be what you're called to be. 
you're giving permission to others to do likewise. When you are being the change you wish to see, you are showing everybody the value of this change. You see, your desire, your calling to be all that you're called to be didn't just come from something you made up in your head. <laughs> you didn't just make it up. You didn't just stumble upon it. This was given you. Think of how strong a cellular calling is. Think of how strong a heart's desire is, what you're called to do, even if you can't put a particular form to it. If you're just called to be happy and radiate joy, if you're called to be gracious and appreciative and love all that comes your way, where do you think this comes from? Where do you think this comes from as my ears are ringing, <laughs> underscoring the efficacy of this, the, the importance of this. Your desire didn't come up from a system of brain uh, firings. Your desire is a profound gift that is given to you from above and all around and within. This is what you're called to express in the world. And so in order for you to know your full self, in order for me to know my full self, in order for our neighbor over down the street to know his or her full self, and in order for us to collectively know our full self, you are called to be the change you wish to see in the world. You need not analyze it. You need not have to figure it out or plan it out, map it out on a 10 year plan. What are you called to do right here and now today? Who are you called to be? How are you called to be? This is not for you alone, but for all of the world with you to enjoy the fruits of the seeds that you are planting. You are the change that you wish to see in the world. We no longer have to separate the two. When you're called to do something in the world in order to become, uh, bring about a change, this change is you. This is who you are. And so nobody can take this from you. It can't be removed from you. It is a natural part of your life experience. And so you can be the change that you wish to see in the world. And you will see it in the world because this is why you have it in the first place. You can believe in whatever you want to believe. And yet, how did you come to this belief in the first place? How was belief given to you in the first place? This is a grand experience. We have a grand, full creator of who we are. And this infinite intelligence is directing you and guiding you every step along the way. And so I'm sharing these things with you, my beloved friend, because I understand that in order for me to thrive, you must thrive. I can't thrive unless you are also thriving. So in order for me to thrive, I'd like to share with you just a bit of thriving. Martin Luther King Jr. said that I cannot be what I ought to be unless you are what you ought to be. And you cannot be what you ought to be unless I am what I ought to be. We are in an inescapable network of mutuality, meaning I cannot thrive unless you are thriving and vice versa. 
And so this may not make any sense according to the world of things and separation. When I have an orange and I give you the orange, then I lose the orange. But this is in complete accordance with the realm of ideas. When I have an idea and I share the idea with you, then I still hold the entire idea. And yet now you have it too. And furthermore, if you embrace this idea, then the idea may grow in my own mind. Somehow I'm even more convicted in this idea by sharing it. So sharing ideas increases the idea. This is the domain of truth. Anything true increases when shared, not diminish, increase. This is how love behaves. When I have love and I share love, then we both experience an increase in love. This is how joy behaves. This is how the experience of truth behaves. And this is how thriving behaves. So what comes first? Having thriving or giving thriving? Both, exactly. The intention of sharing thriving is what brings it forth to the both of us. So here is a bit of thriving for you and for me. Planetary awakening is a fact we're beginning to interact as if one another had one mother. Love, not undercover. Let's take a minute just to intuit to it. Wisdom is fluid moving from all avenues into your mind, which was designed before time. Your life is more than a four-dimensional line. I'm talking about your body and history. Do you really think that's the extent of your mystery? Maybe we need an intervention to transcend the first four dimensions and five senses. Let's get a sense of the immenseness, all the events that we've just missed. Of course, this is just a short list. More important is the path we forge with. Your drift is a tour de gorgeous that no contortionist can twist out of alignment. It is divine assignment to identify with more than just an island. When you shed your physicality, then you'll get that death is illusory. Then you'll see the ego was merely a dream and all perceived enemies were really on your team. This is humanity's creed. Oneness comes with but one belief. It's one belief away or belief in one today. Once again, one, I'll say. Wonder is discovered in the other and coming to find that there is none, my brother. Envision above, unconditional love. Intermission is a gift, so give it a nudge. Inhibit the grudge and you'll muster strength to loosen its illusory luster. Truth comes as a cluster. When you pursue with trust, it must occur. Right always are you the customer, I must infer. With you, him, us, and her, that we're in it together for better. Combining the things that we do like some letters to formulate words into flesh without fetters, trendsetters. 
Humans with feathers, wings spread wide as we glide, rise up to heaven, wise ones use meditation as leaven. In case you cannot believe what you don't, remember that you can, you just won't. Given enough time and you will, for truth stands, open-handed and still, waiting for us to decide or for our soul to spill. The choice is ours, in hand is quill. What will you write in this life? What news do you invite? How do you handle our strife? Are you just you or are you universal? It's but a simple reversal of thought to begin where we ought to be. We need not leave before we be, for only thereafter can we believe. Belief is a choice that stems from perspective. Perspective, a belief stemming from choice. Choice, a perspective stemming from belief. These three are up to you and determine what you see. They determine if there is a you separate from me, or if you are really me. Kapishi? That means, do you understand? I know you do, because I am you. Don't get confused, because you are you too, and there's nothing you need to do. You can't be any less or more than you. Think of what you is, and think of who you are. You are what I am. You are what I am. You are the perfect image of creation, and you observe the image of yourself in all the world around you. You may not be the center of the universe, but you is its beginning, and you are too. The Master Jesus told us to be alert and be prepared, for the kingdom comes like a thief in the night. And what I believe he was saying in this is that the very act of preparing for something, the very act of being alert, actively brings this thing to us. When we prepare for a guest to come to our house for a visit, we know that the guest is arriving. There's no question in our mind whether the guest will show or not. We're preparing because the guest is arriving. So too, when we prepare for the kingdom to come, in other words, when we prepare for universal flourishing, we are actively setting into motion all the spiritual cogs and components to bring forth manifestationally universal flourishing. We're setting it into motion. We're already affirming that it is coming by preparing for it, preparing the way for its arrival. And so only you knows what it, only you know what it's like to prepare. Only you know the form it might take of preparing the way or, or being alert for universal flourishing to come. Maybe you're called to just think about it every so often. Maybe you're come to speak to somebody about it. Maybe you're called to help somebody to embrace a lifestyle choice. Or maybe you yourself may be called into embracing a lifestyle choice. Only you know the answer to this. The important thing is that we set the intention. When we set an intention, we're setting, we're increasing the tension in our bow of collective life trajectory. And when we intend something, then it becomes what we tend to do. So when we set the intention of universal flourishing, we are pointed in that direction, which is right here <laughs> and everywhere. When we intend universal flourishing, then we tend to act as if it is here, or at least on its way or at hand. And so you right now, in your preparedness, in your willingness to embrace universal flourishing, are playing a critical role in its coming forth. Act as if it's on the way. And when all of us come together, or at least enough of us come together and act from this point, we are bringing it forth manifestationally and we will see it before we even realize what we have done.
So your unique calling, your unique expression, the way you express yourself in words or symbols or forms, your unique image, your unique path, all of these are your authenticity. And your authenticity is your strength, is your power. For better or for worse, we have largely been conditioned into believing that we need to trade our authenticity for something that's greater, some sort of external ideal, because we of ourselves are not enough. This is exactly wrong. Your authenticity is your strength. And it may be uncomfortable initially to share your authenticity, but this is ultimately why you are here and why you were placed on the earth at this point in history, right here and now, to express and live and embody your authentic self, which is your gift to the world. When you live authentically and express yourself in only the way that you know authenticity is, you are sharing this with all the world and you don't need external validation to confirm that your authentic self is good or valuable. You will just see it naturally. But more importantly, this is a service that you're offering to the world, your authentic self. And so you don't have to share yourself. There's nothing forcing you to sharing into sharing your authentic self, but you can. And when you do, you are, whole, you are sharing your gifts with the world. If you don't, you're just holding it back, which is fine. <laughs> but you can also offer it as a gift to all the world. And guess what? When you share your authenticity with the world, this resides in the realm of truth. All of the world shares authenticity with you. So the more you express, and so ultimately you just express your full authentic self all the time in this world as a gift for all of the world, all of the world becomes a gift for you. All of the world becomes an authentic world, a rich, fully rich, authentic experience just for you. As we authentically express ourselves in this life, it seems almost inevitable that we encounter some form of disagreement, which leads into this temptation or seduction of conflict. The most important thing for us to hold is this value of oneness. Oneness is a core value. It is the core value. Many organizations have the 10 core values and they differ from the other organization's 10 core values. Somebody may hold a list of beliefs which may differ from somebody else's list of beliefs. But we all share, all organizations, all people share the one core value, which is oneness. That we are all part of the same one thing. That we share one reality. That we are all one. That God is that we are here together. All of these are saying the same thing. Oneness is, and nothing is more important than oneness. No surface level disagreement is more important than oneness. Oneness is our core value. Notice what this means in terms of what it's not. The core value is not being right or looking good, or any other sort of trivial thing. Oneness is our core value. So when engaging in this world, in communication with people or organizations, we must know and embrace that oneness is the most important thing. To be in agreement, profound agreement. The fact that we are here, together now is profound agreement. We could not be, but we are. And, and we could be anywhere, but we're here together. This is profound agreement. Anything that we could disagree about is trivial. And so we could say, well, we're speaking of apples and oranges. We have irreconcilable differences, but well, they're both fruit. <laughs> Hold on a moment. 
We're both talking about fruit here. Are we talking about the fruit of life? Or would you like to trivialize the matter and to surface uh, a surface uh, observation of the world, a surface view of the world? We're speaking of the fruit of life. This is oneness. We need not be tempted into disagreement or conflict. When we're disagreeing, we're not actually saying anything. Almost certainly, we're using a set of symbols to communicate an idea, and this person is doing the same, and we're defining the symbols in a vastly different way. So the disagreement is not actually saying anything. To remain in, in agreement is the most important thing for us, bringers of salvation into this world, to remain in agreement. Not to agree to disagree, because that doesn't even mean anything but agree to agree on the most fundamental level that we're here together, that we are really the same, and that any sort of disagreement we may have is really just a chance for us to better mutually understand each other. And that we may disagree over a policy or our favorite book, but all that is doing is, is allowing us an opportunity to better know ourselves and each other. Oneness is the most important value. Stay firm in this. All of this is to say that within you is the power of one, which is the power of all of this. All of this is one with itself, with all of us, with you, all of this physical world, all of our mental world and our spiritual world is one with you. All of it is contained within you. You are a blueprint for this one, this collective one. You have all the information to know all of the universe. It's, it's within you. You can look for science to, to verify this fact, this holographic nature of this universe, that, that you are actually a blueprint for the whole. And so we've been trained into thinking that, well, we just approach infinity, that, that just 999 to the 999 power, and, and you keep getting larger and larger in, in quantity, that that's, that's more complete. But really, the truth is that Whenever we add more than one, when we add the concept of more than into our vocabulary and, and into our experience, then we also introduce simultaneously the concept of less than. We can't have more if we also are not introducing less. They're the same concept. It's something that is neither one. It is not one. <laughs> More or less than one is not one. So there is the understanding of one, which is oneness. And then there's a belief in something else. Uh, believing that there's something else and acting as if it's true and seeing value in something other than one. And so we can act from a place of superiority and believe that we are superior over others, of other people or things in our life, or creatures. But we can't hold that without also bringing in the feeling of inferior to other things. It is impossible to be superior to everything in this life. Because when we are superior to something, we are automatically inferior to something else. And so, it may seem like a sacrifice to give up our superiority over some things, but really it's a, it's a false superiority. When we give up the idea of superiority, we also give up the idea of inferiority, and what we're left with is one. No more, no less. In its great, profound, full extravagance is you, the one, to bring forth oneness in all of this world. You are invited, you are called, and we all thank you, I thank you, for being the one. <laughs>